know why they're Okay, here we go. So we got our first our first derivative to take, which I think is the easiest rule to apply. And people don't seem to have much trouble doing it, maybe understanding the concept and, and getting it completely out if they have trouble with it. But memorizing the rule, typically people don't have a, tr have a problem with that. So, um, let's, well, to use a product rule, we need the product of two functions. Right? So what are the two functions here? X. X. Cube. Cosine of X. Cosine of X. Let's respect the trigonometry and call it cosine of X. Okay, not cos. F prime. Uh, how do we find f prime? How do we use the product rule? F prime times g of x plus, plus b prime. Of x. So now this is already called f. We we could also call this u, and we call this v. And so this would be u prime v plus v prime u. Right that way. So u prime is. Go ahead. Three x cubed, cubed per squared. Cubed. Oh, oh, squared times. Cosine of x. That's cosine of x. Careful that you don't take the derivative of the cosine right Plus, now. Plus, isn't that negative sine? No, it's just negative sine. Well, x cubed. That's negative sine. We could put, uh, if you want to take the derivative, it doesn't really matter, right? Multiplication is commutative. So we could go minus the sine of x, the derivative of cosine of x. x cubed. Times x cubed. I'll just put parentheses there so that nothing gets confused. Does the book, in the book, if you look at it, does it do it backwards? Like, you do? I don't remember. What does it take G prime first? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I think, I think it does. So I was looking at it since I missed class. I was watching YouTube videos and I'm looking in the book and like on Top Cat where I have worked out odd ones. And I'm pretty sure that it teaches it like U, it's U and then V prime, and then it's really weird. Product well, if it was u v prime, which this that's u v prime right there, right? Yeah, it's just v like flipping. I yeah, I don't remember if they flip it. I think I remember wondering why they would do it. Why would you do it the other order, the opposite order of, of the order that the, the quotient rule is in? Because the quotient rule, the, the order is very important because it's subtraction, mm -hmm. right? Not so much the multiplication parts, but the subtraction part is important. So. Why they would make it the opposite order and make it difficult to remember, I don't know. That's why I teach it this way, yeah. the derivative of the, take the derivative of the first thing first. That's that kind of makes YouTube sense. YouTube videos taught it like that, and I was in the book, and I was like, what are you doing? The YouTube videos like this? Yeah. Mine was? Well, I watched yours, and uh -huh. then there's like, wow math or something. Uh-huh. This guy with a weird, like, list thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> wow math? Is it a YouTube channel, or is yeah, it like a so. website? Yeah, I think so, I don't know. Okay. He's the first one that pops up if you type in, like, the whole name of the chapter. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to work on it and be the first one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this, you know, and, and the order isn't important in the product rule. You're multiplying and you're adding, both of which are commutative. You can switch the order and it won't affect anything. But when you go to the quotient rule and it's a different order and you take the derivative of the numerator of the of the first function first, I don't know. That, that's, that's just the way. I tried a stronger word than that. Yeah, to calculus. Please stop letting people teach you this. No, it's because people who wrote the book. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let, let's let's keep going here. Here's a nice little rhyme that will help you remember the quotient. What? Okay. It's low d high minus. Why is it? These are not cool. Minus uh, high. D low over the square oh. of what's below. Oh, wow. Did you make this up? No. Oh. It's well known. Low D high minus high D low over the square of what's below. Okay. <laughs> so what does that mean low? The denominator. What's D high? Derivative of the Derivative of the high of the numerator yeah. minus high d low the numerator minus the uh, minus the numerator times the, the uh, derivative of the denominator over the square of what's below the square of the denominator. Okay, so low and below rhyme, and so it can help you remember. Because if you do high d low minus low d high over the square of what's below, it doesn't. Those last two lines don't rhyme. Okay, so you know it's one of those. Right. 
So which order is it? It's the order where they arrive. Right. You can prove that the quotient rule works, but I wouldn't expect you to prove it to yourself. Some things I would expect you to prove to yourself every time if you forgot. So reassure yourself, yeah, that works. Okay. But the quotient rule, no, it, it is more of a memorization thing, as is the product rule as is the chain rule, as is a lot of things in calculus, okay? okay? So, there's a little rhyme, you can use that. <coughs> All right, so we have high and low, numerator and denominator. The derivative is low d high, what's low? X, X squared. X squared. Cosine. Cosine x minus high d low. 2x. Two 2x two sine x. You can multiply those in any order you want. Over x to the fourth. Where four. what's below x to the fourth. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, you can, I guess you could factor out a, an x from both of those or something. Sometimes the answer in the book is really weird. What's that? Can you do that? Factor out an x? So I did that in the homework. Does this have a factor of x? It does x times x. Does it have a factor of x? Yes. It does 2 times x. So you could x times x cosine x minus 2 sine x over x to the fourth. And then we could cancel this x with one of these x's. So that does kind of make it simpler. x cosine x minus 2 sine x over x to the third. And then so you're that. fine if we were doing that first one. Sure. Yeah. Okay. If yeah, both do the the book same. gives them like it gave you weird answers sometimes, but that's that's kind of nice. I mean, if if it just gave you exactly what you wrote down, then it'd be magical. No, I don't know if it'd be magical. It would be lucky, but also it forces you to take your thing and put it in the form of their answer, which is something you're gonna have to do on multiple choice tests, like the AP test. Anyway, okay. So again, low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. So f prime of x. Low is what? X squared minus one. Minus one. Oop, should have put it in equals. Uh, so low, d high. Uh, 3x squared, squared plus three. three. Minus high, d low. Over the square of what's below. Square that. And the book, I can almost guarantee they're going to multiply these together, multiply these together, put together like terms, cancel any common factors if there are any, probably there aren't. Okay. Uh, they're going to get into one. What's that? And when you do that, you're only like one variable difference equal to make it equal one. So you're like one. one variable difference? It makes it look like it's like, oh, hey, I can like cancel these out. Oh. It's like, no, nope, can't. Well, don't be tempted by that. <laughs> we are way beyond that. From the, like, the second half of, what's that? We're way beyond making technique. Yeah, we're way beyond this. Yeah, way beyond making it almost looked like it was like, yay, yeah. oh no, I just made it simple. Okay. So, here we are again. Now, when we go to take the derivative of the numerator, we got to decide how that goes, because it is a function, 3 times another function, 1 minus sine x. So well, we got we got low, 2 cosine x, d high. How are we going to take the derivative of the numerator when it's 3 times another function? You could do the product rule. You've got 3, <laughs> right? You've got a function here, 3, and a function here, 1 minus sine x. You could do that, but think about this. Isn't 3 a? 3 is a constant? So that's not zero. Yeah, so what's going to happen is you're going to um, take the derivative of 3, which is 0, and multiply it by that. So one half of the pro product rule would go away when you have the product of a constant and a function that's not a constant. Uh, so really what it comes down to is 3 times the derivative of this, which that's just the constant multiple rule. The constant multiple rule says if you have a constant times a function, you're going to take the derivative, multiply the constant times the derivative of the function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so three times the derivative of this. What's the derivative of this? Zero. Derivative of negative sine. Negative cosine. So we can put a negative three cosine x. Okay, so that's low d high minus high. Uh, one sine minus sine x. High 
Uh, G low. Uh, was two is What's that? Okay, here again, we have a constant times a function. So it's just two You have a constant times a function. You just take the derivative of the function and multiply it by the constant. Yep. Two negative sine. Two negative sine. You got a negative, cos or negative sine x is the derivative of cosine x, so you got this is going to be positive. Yep. Okay, what's the rest of it? Two, two sine. sine. Okay, so you got negative two times the cosine, or negative two times the sine of x. That negative made this negative positive. And two times three, we can make six. And then we can multiply this by sine x. All over the square of what's below, which will be four, cosine squared x. What is the cursor doing? Can you tell what, can you see the cursor changing and maybe the What? That I'm writing, that I'm writing. I'm not crazy. It is doing it. Okay. Hey, <laughs> it's doing it. Uh, and then we can multiply these together. We can get uh, negative, s negative six uh, cosine squared x uh, plus, we could, we could distribute. Mm. So we get plus six mm. sine x yeah. minus sine squared x. It's fine. And then we, could, we could possibly, I don't know, cancel something out. No, that's fine. Yeah, we could good. factor out it too. We could factor out a two. So we could factor out right? a six. I mean, we could yeah. factor out a so you're six. You're all right just leaving it right there? Huh? So you're all right just leaving it there? Or do you need to simplify it I mean, or anything? Here's a, a, a secret about the AP test. If you give them this answer, and it's right, you've done it correctly, but most uh, calculus teachers or calculus textbook writers would choose to multiply this stuff together, which I would do. Like if I if I were doing this and I had the time to do it, I would multiply this together and I would simplify it as much as possible. Because if I need to work with it later, I much rather would have it simplified uh, and plug things into fewer places where x exists than all of these. But if all you want to do is tell them what the derivative of that function is, and this is correct, and it could be simplified to the answer that that I would get if I simplified it, then you get full school. You get full credit for it. Can we simplify it real quick? Sure. If, if it's possible, I, I, let's see. Let's just multiply these together first. So negative six cosine squared x. Um, let's see, then we're gonna, we're gonna double distribute here, right? So we're gonna distribute six sine x into here. So plus six sine x uh, minus six sine squared x over or cosine squared x. Let me run that over here. Just make more. Uh, and uh, I don't know why we didn't do this to start with, but we can factor out a, a, a six. Let's do uh, a negative six. Can we see something else that's going to happen? Okay. When I factor out a negative, this becomes positive and this becomes positive. So I have a sine squared and a cosine squared. So I can do sine squared plus cosine squared. Uh, plus sine over four cosine squared x. When does the, when the sine be negative? Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Did I do that wrong? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Minus sine x. What's sine squared plus cosine? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we got some people remembering from last year. Great. Uh, also, the six and the four can cancel. This will be a negative three. This will be a positive two. So negative three times one minus sine x so over nice. two cosine squared x. Hang on, did that work? That's, that's nicer. The original What's that? That's almost the same as the original problem. Wait, isn't cosine squared easy. x one minus sine x technically the same? Uh, Say again. Cosine squared x is one minus sine squared x. That's true. That's very good. So negative three oh. times one minus sine x. This is one minus sine squared. Do you see it? Do you see it happening? Yeah. It's driving me nuts. Okay, no. one minus sine no. squared. No. This is what you are seeing. Watch the cursor as I write. Okay. I do need oh, a nap, but that has nothing that. to do with this. <laughs> and this is, what's one minus sine squared? Sure. It's a, 
So we got <laughs> two times one plus sine x times one minus sine x. Boom. Negative three over two times one plus sine x. Wait. We can take it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So <laughs> that one. Very beginning one. Oh no, go back. That one. This right? one? Yeah. If that's basically the problem above, it's where we start out with, can't we just start right there? Yeah. I mean, it's whoa. Right it's, there. It is yeah. different. It's, what do you mean start? The oh. only thing that's different right there is Cosine squared. Okay. Cosine squared. We got a negative three instead a negative of a three. Just a negative three squared and a positive three. That's all we need to know. That's the shortcut we're learning today. <laughs> <laughs> and you see that function specifically. <laughs> Plug in just the square root. Yep. And you make the cosine squared. Make the three negative. <laughs> and you're done. And hey, that that work with any constant? No, you're not. No, done. it wouldn't you're work with any constant. No, no. Okay, just, yeah, we're going to leave just, it at that yeah, top one and be done. <laughs> so you can leave it like that. But here's the thing. If you were doing a problem where it said, okay, then take that derivative and do stuff with it. Find the second derivative. Oh, if you had to find the second derivative. Of that? Of that, that'd be insane. Uh, of this? Not so bad. Still right? Bad. Not so bad. Um, <laughs> if, if you needed to use this function to find the slope of the tangent line, you could do it with this one. You'd have to plug it in. One, two, three, four, five places. That's five places you could make a mistake when you're calculating something based on x. Here, you plug it in one place. Right? So that's my commercial for simplifying it. Okay. Right? And getting good at it. And my other commercial would, would be uh, you might be doing the multiple choice and have this, and you did it right. But then the answer, you know, uh, letter C, is this. And none of the answers, all the answers are going to look something like this. None of them are going to look like what you have, and you're going to feel like you did it wrong. And then you're going to be upset because you spent 10 minutes doing what would have been the right answer. Like, then you're going to try and correct it and figure out what you did wrong. Try and simplify it down to one of the answers. And then 30 minutes later, you, like, you spent 30 minutes on one problem and screwed over And then you just weep like a kitten. Kids <laughs> <laughs> don't weep. Okay, so, oh, yes, yes. Is, is there any question about the quiz? Any part of that confuse you? Mm -hmm. I'm still a little, like, on that one to the point where I know I can do the quotient form with this, but mm -hmm. I'm sure with time. With time, yes. You will get some wrong, and it will take time. Oh, okay. Okay. If you're not quite sure, though, what you should do before you're assessed on it uh, is to um, you know take time to practice. Take some of the homework problems that weren't assigned, do them, and see if you can get them correct. Is this class later? Yes. Oh, magical. Uh, any questions from the homework at all? Um, 92. Uh, after Kelly. Hey. After Kelly goes. Jeez, just trying to jump in front of Kelly. Uh, Ten. Oh, there's my book. H of s equals s over square root of s minus 1. Can you, just, can you change the s's to x's? I um, wouldn't, but you could. It looks like fives. Well? Your f's do look like fives. That is I do very have a problem true. with that, but you're just going to have to. I do try when I make a five, if it, if it looks like an s, to come back and okay. so make it pointy. But, so when we're doing derivatives of square roots, yeah. So if it's like, how do you say it when there's like a three what little tail thing? Third root. Third root. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with s to the third root, would that be one third s to the negative one third? Is that how it works? No. Um, uh, let's see. Wouldn't it be up to the one third? I'm not. 
looking for the right answer. I'm not confused about that. I want to explain it well. So if you find it in okay. So let's take s divided by the square root of s. Okay. You know that. Let's see. Does that help? Um, What about what is like, what does s to the fourth root just look like just s to the fourth root if you drive? Let me, let me, let me do this, okay? How about uh, the square root of s times the square root of s? What is that? S. S. It comes out to be mm -hmm. s, okay? Now, uh, we know that when you multiply two things like s squared and s squared, what do you do with their exponents? You add them, you add them together, okay? So, if we were to write this as the product of, of two s's with exponents, right? what exponent do we wind up getting? One. Yes. Okay. No, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, these so are, are blanks, right? I don't know what these are yet. Oh, okay. right? We're making it have to work. It's the blank plus the blank. So it's blank plus blank, blank plus identical blank equals one, right? What does that have to be? One half. One half. One half. Okay. And the same could be true of the uh, third root of s times the third root of s times the third root of s. What's that equal to? S to the third. S to the first. S. It's s to the first. Yeah. Right. The third root of s is defined as a number that multiplies by itself three times to make s. Right. Yes. The third root of eight is two because two times two times two is eight. Right. The third root of s is the third root of s because the third root of s times the third root of s times the third root of s is s, by definition. Okay. So if we were to let these be s to the blank times s to the blank times s to the blank, and know that we have to add these three things together, which are identical, and get one, what would those powers have one to be? Third, one, one third power. Okay. One third. One third. Um, now, another thing that I think might confuse you is the fact, like we know that this is now s to the 1 half, right? Okay, no big deal. Um, but it being in the denominator might confuse you as well. You think it might need to be a negative power, right? But think about what you're supposed to be doing here. If we have the derivative of u over b, then the derivative is u prime v minus v prime u over v squared. Now, so, so there's the derivative, or there's the denominator right there. We're supposed to take the derivative of it, of it the way it looks, right? Without regard to the fact that it's in the denominator, as far as it concerns like negative exponents and things like that, right? In the denominator, it is just a function. Uh, so we just take the derivative of it like normal. Okay. What, how do you do the, that's my question. So, oh, your question you is, so you recognize that u is to the one half, or yeah, s is to the one half. one half. Okay, I'm sorry that I, I took all that I time. Those, but, like, so if it's like just like taking the derivative of s, um, and like there's a So we're just taking the derivative of the square root of s, which is s to the one half. Mm -hmm. We're going to take the derivative of that, then we bring this down yeah. here, one half s to the subtract one from that, negative, negative, negative half. half, yeah. Okay, so that, okay, that's what I was asking. Sorry about that, I, okay. I thought you were confused. <laughs> Sorry, okay. S, okay, so low, that's the square root of s, minus one. D high, that's the derivative of s with respect to s, one. Uh, minus high, s. D low, which we just did that mm -hmm. part right there, one half, s to the negative one half, uh, minus zero, so. That's the end of that derivative. Over the square of what's below, square root of s minus 1 squared. Okay. And that could be it. Could be all we did. That would be fine. <coughs> all right. Is it 92? 92. 92. The satellite question? Yeah. Huh? Can you just do the second part to B? Just the second part? Yeah. 
Unless anybody else wants the first part. Mm -hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. a Wow. 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 How? You press the circle. Even though you have a circle. Should have been a Does anybody want to see the first part? Part A, show that H equals R times the cosecant of theta minus 1. Okay. Um, so we're solving for H, right? We want to get H equals something with respect to apparently R and theta. Okay. This triangle here is what kind of triangle? It's really important. I thought. Right triangle. It's a right triangle. Um, it's not isosceles. Um, so let, let's involve H in some equation with R and theta and then solve for H. Okay. So can you relate H to R and theta? Is there any kind of relationship there? Probably H plus R over H plus R R over R over R. So this side, the hypotenuse over this side, the opposite side to this angle here is? The cosecant theta. The cosecant of theta. And so hypotenuse over opposite, that's the reciprocal of the sine, and that's the cosecant. So uh, H plus R equals R cosecant theta, H equals R cosecant theta minus R, H equals R times cosecant theta minus 1. Factor out that factor of R. Okay? Uh, yeah, I'll just take that shrink down here. So there's A and B. Find the rate at which H is changing with respect to theta when theta is 30 degrees. We have to find the acceleration, right? The acceleration? Isn't that what? Well, this function right here, this function, if we know the radius, which, doesn't the Earth have a radius? Yes. yes. Does it change? Well, Does it change in a way that we pay attention to? It's not a perfect sphere, but we do have a radius that we accept as like, okay, like average radius. For problems like this, we make it a sphere. There was like this thing, it was just like a random back, I don't even know if it's a back or not, it's on Facebook, so it's questionable. Uh -huh. But it said that the Earth, if you shrank it down to the size of a bowling ball, that it would be smoother than a bowling ball. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So a bowling ball is bumpier than the Earth at, at the same size. Yeah. Oh. If you yeah if you if you blew the, the bowling ball up to the size of the Earth it probably looked like I don't know I always think of uh, the Superman Returns where Lex Luthor grows that kryptonite island and it's all craggy and sharp and stuff and yeah that's probably what a bowling ball would look like uh, all over the place have you guys read the article like the ten most dangerous places on Earth no you should just search it it's a, it's terrifying. So, <laughs> this function right here, this function right here, if we know r, which we do, it is a fact, it is known, uh, or there is a value that we can accept as r. If we're given theta, uh, right, the angle between um, the, I guess, the, the line that comes straight out of the center of the Earth to the satellite, uh, and then from the satellite to the horizon. Whatever that, if that angle is changing, uh, then the the height must be changing, right? If the height stays the same, that angle should stay the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. So if that angle is changing, if that angle is bigger, then h must be bigger or smaller. If the angle gets bigger, should h be smaller or bigger? Bigger. Bigger. H would have to be smaller. If you want the angle to be bigger then the angle would be like from here to there, to be bigger, so h would have to be smaller. Okay, so as theta changes, h changes. Okay. 
we want to see uh, how is it changing with respect to theta, okay? So we have like dy dx here, except for it's dh d theta. It's how is h changing as theta changes. dh d theta. So we take the, the derivative of both, spi d both sides with respect to theta, remembering that r is what kind of a thing? Constant. It's a constant. It's just a number. Okay. So then we go to, we go to take the derivative of this side with respect to theta, like theta was x. Okay. That's what we mean, mean when we say with respect to theta, as if theta was x. How do you take the derivative of this function with respect to theta? And what do we do about this r here? Do we have to use the product rule here? Yeah? No, it's a constant. So we don't have the product rule, we go back to the what? Constant multiple. Constant multiple rule. So we have r times the derivative of this function. What's the derivative of the cosecant? Um, negative cosecant x over cotangent. Negative cosecant cotangent. Okay, minus the derivative of 1? Zero. Zero. So, uh, <coughs> cosecant, sorry, theta. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's real nice. Yeah. Now I'm doing better. Wow, wait. Christmas. Are you mocking me? Okay. Does it say R is, in, R is, is given? <laughs> R is 3960. So 3960 times negative cosecant of, what does it say? 30 degrees. Uh, cotangent of 30 degrees. And cosecant is a reciprocal of what? Co. Nope. Nope. Sine. Sine. Yep, that so one. So 3960 times, what's the sine of 30 degrees? Oh. One half. No, that would be. Sine of 3 degrees. Root 3 over 2. It's what? Root 3 over 2. No, I think you had it right. One half. It's one half. It's one half. So, one half. so two, right? The reciprocal of one half would be two. Uh, times the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of the tangent, and the tangent is sine over cosine. Okay, so sine one half over cosine root three over two equals one half times two over root three. One over root three. That's the tangent. Okay. So root three. So. Uh, negative 7,920 root 3. Mm -hmm. Wow. 3,000 times 2 is 6,000. 60 times 2 is 1.9. Is that right? Is it 7,000? Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, uh, it's just multiplying by 2. 2 is not so bad. Uh, times root 3. What are the units? Something is changing here, right? The height is changing. Miles? <coughs> Just miles? Yeah. But Delta miles? Delta miles. Mm -hmm. Mile, right? Yeah. The, we're going to assume that the angle is changing at a constant rate. So like, you know, like one degree per minute or something like that, right? But we don't know how fast it's changing. We just know that it's changing at a constant rate. So however long it takes to add a degree to that angle, it'll take the same amount of time to add another angle, or another degree, and another degree, and another degree. Right? Okay. Um, so miles is changing, right? The distance, uh, and, it, and it's getting smaller, right? And it's getting smaller with respect to what? What is changing that's causing this to change? The angle. The angle. And what units is the angle in? So, so miles per degrees. Miles per degree, I guess. We should write the word degree instead of a little circle.
my god. What is going on? Yeah, what happened to Sweet Kids? Yeah. See, nice. Oh, we're looking like Be kind to others. <laughs> talk about these ones, the important ones that get used most oh, no. often oh. are these guys. Okay. So, anybody have an idea what the derivative of the tangent is without looking it up? Okay, so we forgot. What? It's, it's sine over cosine, so wouldn't it be like Negative cosine x over, yeah, or you're something like that. You're doing the quotient over negative sine, negative sine. Using the quotient rule on sine over cosine. Oh, yeah. oh. That's great. Yes. Great job, all you. Yeah. But I mean, we, we don't want to do that every time. We should be able to do it every time. Okay. So if we use the quotient rule on sine over cosine. We'll come out getting secant squared. Okay. Same with secant. With secant, I'll stretch out this circle. Whoa. Whoa. With uh, with the secant, it's one over mm -hmm. cosine. So you could do the same thing. You could do the quotient rule with one over cosine, which is cool. Um, and when you do, you will wind up getting secant tangent. Secant x times tangent x. I'm sure it's reversible. Yeah. Tangent has secant, secant has tangent. Yeah, well, it's not that way, buddy. So, <laughs> wow. Okay, and then the derivative of the cotangent is negative cosecant squared. Cosecant, negative cosecant x times cotangent x. The big important ones that you use most often that they will assume more often than not that you know these derivatives is for tangent and secant. Sine, cosine, tangent, right? Uh, and then I assume since tangent's derivative is involving the secant, then also we involve the secant so that we get the derivative involving secant and tangent and all that kind of stuff. Because the sine, cosine, tangent are your standard three and the tangent derivative involves the secant, so let's throw secant in there as well. That's my theory. Did you take the, did you take the derivative of secant and tangent? What makes it more complicated than cosine? Um, well, you don't even know how to take the derivative of, say, like secant squared, right? Uh, unless you did secant times secant, then you could use the product rule. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it would keep cycling around eventually. <laughs> but what we need to do is continue on. Okay. Those are good questions. But the we're derivative of the cotangent is it, did you try to cross out the two and make it a one? Uh, no, I don't know why that marks left there. Okay, I was just checking. <laughs> Accident. All right, let's look at the second problem. This surrounded by pink here. Take a look at that. Take a look at that. Give us a thought. Number six. Number six. Don't worry about any other things except for six. Particle's moving and its velocity is given by this function. Now, 
unless that function's always zero, the arm is moving at some point. The only way, if this defines its velocity, which is telling you how fast it's moving, yeah. unless this is always worth zero, whatever, whatever value of t you plug in. Oh, it's at time zero, velocity, okay. Okay, yeah, time zero. All right. <gasps> So would the acceleration be negative 2? Say again? Would the acceleration be negative 2? Why would you say that? Because x is negative 2? Because, so isn't acceleration the distance over the velocity or something? Um, it's something like that. And you plug in the 0 for time. In here? Yeah, so it's going to be cosine of the 0, which on the unit circle isn't that 1? Yep, yeah, it's 1. Cosine is 1. Yeah, so it's, wouldn't it be, or is it negative one half for the acceleration? Uh, so how are you getting from velocity to acceleration that way? When you get one half, then what are you doing? I'm guessing, I can't remember the equation, like the thing. Um, <coughs> well, you can't just say my velocity is one half and then know what your acceleration is. No, isn't the velocity one? One, okay, one, yeah, yeah. So the velocity is one. Yeah. But if I say my velocity is one mile an hour, that doesn't give me any information about how. Yeah, I, I was just making a guess. Okay. Because I don't, I don't actually know the like, the thing for um, acceleration. <laughs> okay. So that's the thing. What is the thing for acceleration? The derivative of the velocity. Okay. So. In the in the derivative game, in the derivative game, it's all about change. It's all about a rate of change. How fast is something changing with respect to some other thing? Okay? And if you take the derivative of something, you're finding out how fast that function is changing with respect to the independent variable. Okay? So velocity. Velocity itself is a change, right? It's a change in what? Time and place. Time and place. Time is changing, place is changing. Where you are, right? That's velocity. Position is a good universal word that we use. So position versus time, that's velocity. Okay? What's acceleration? What's changing in acceleration? Velocity. Your velocity is changing, your speed's changing. Right? That's what acceleration is. It's a measure of the change in velocity, just like velocity is a measure of the change in position. So if we have a, if we have a function that tells us the velocity, how do we figure out how that velocity is changing, how that function is changing? Derivative is all about rate of change. Derivative of one would be zero. Uh, but you don't take the derivative of the output of the function. You okay. take the derivative of the function and see what you get when you plug that in. So the derivative of the cosine of pi uh, pi over six uh, t pi over six t, which here I'll just give you this one because I'm realizing that you can't do this yet. So. Uh, it's going to be, so I'm saying the acceleration function is uh, b prime of t, so that's the derivative of the velocity. So it's uh, pi over 6 times, let's see, negative pi over 6 sine uh, of pi over 6t. Negative pi over 6 sine of pi over 6t. That's, that's too small. Knowing that that's the velocity, or that's the acceleration function, that's the derivative of the velocity function. Um, what it's saying is find the acceleration of the particle uh, at time t. Did we do that yet? No. Wait, it's one. Huh? It's one. No, not time one, time t. General. Do we have the acceleration in general? If you knew t, t could you find the acceleration? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because we took the derivative of the velocity function. Mm -hmm. Is the speed of the particle increasing, decreasing, or neither at time t equals 4? And explain your reasoning. It's going back and forth, but if a, if a cosine or a, a sine wave is, de, is deciding what your acceleration is, right? then at some times your, your acceleration could be positive if the sine wave comes above the x-axis, and it could be negative if it goes below the x-axis. Right? So how would you tell that though? It could be decreasing and increasing. Or 
looking at this big planet before. Well, oh, if wow. I'm speeding up, if I'm speeding up from a standstill, what would you say about my acceleration? It's increasing. It's what? It's increasing. My acceleration's increasing? Velocity. Your velocity's increasing. So what would you say about your acceleration? It's positive. It's positive, right? It could also be increasing. But all you need to say about acceleration um, with regards to if you're speeding up or slowing down is if you're speeding up, it's positive. Uh, if you're slowing down, it's negative. Okay. And we'll, let's see, we need to pay special attention to this word in just a second. Okay. So here's how you could be, your, now, now the, here's the important part, speed, the word speed. What's the difference between speed and velocity? Speed is just a matter of velocity has a direction. Velocity has a direction or a sign, a positive or a negative. So speed is just a magnitude. It won't have a sign. It'll just be well, positive for all intents and purposes. Okay? So um, how can you be speeding up? Right? That's the question. Your then your your speed would be increasing. The magnitude of your velocity would be increasing. So you could be moving forward and moving forward faster and faster and faster. That would be speeding up. You could be moving backward and moving backward faster and faster and faster, right? So if I'm moving forward, what would you say about my velocity? It's increasing. Oh, your velocity is positive. Okay, if you're moving forward, your velocity is positive. If I'm speeding up and I'm moving forward, what would you say about my acceleration? It's also positive. If you're moving backward and you're speeding up, your velocity is negative. And your acceleration is negative because you're going faster, faster, and faster. Okay, so that's what we'd be looking for in increasing, right? Velocity is positive, acceleration is positive. What about slowing down? If I'm moving in a forward direction, what about my velocity? What about if I'm slowing down? What would you say about my acceleration? Negative. Negative. It's taken away from your velocity, right? If I'm moving backwards, what would you say about velocity? And if I'm, ex if, I'm ex if I'm slowing down, what do you say about my acceleration? Positive. It's positive. I'm trying to get going that direction, right, by my acceleration. Okay? So speeding up, positive and positive, or negative and negative. Slowing down, positive velocity, negative acceleration, I'm slowing down. Or negative velocity, positive acceleration. So how do we figure these things out? How do we figure out if the velocity is positive or negative, acceleration is positive or negative? At time, t equals 4. Plug in what? T. T is 4, right? Where? At T. In T. In T. Of what? Of this or of that? The acceleration function. The acceleration. Okay, so you put T in there, that's 4. That's uh, 2 pi over 3. What's the sign of 2 pi over 3? Square root of 3 over 2. 3, three over 2 uh, times negative pi over 6. Then what we're worried about here is, is it positive or negative? So it's a negative. So our acceleration is negative. Acceleration is negative. Put a four in there. Should be. Twos cancel. Oh. You get two pi over three. Four pi over six, which means pi over three. Okay, then. Okay, so my acceleration is negative. Does that mean anything necessarily? It means your velocity. Well, you'd be slowing down if you were going in a positive direction, positive velocity. And you're or speeding that backwards. Because we're speeding up backwards. So it doesn't tell us if we're slowing down or speeding up. We have to know about the velocity. Are you moving forward and slowing down? Or are you moving backwards and speeding up? You're right, telling the velocity. So we put 4 into the velocity function. What's the cosine of 2 pi over 3? Well, I mean, the square root of x is positive. Right? Huh? Positive. So. What's positive? That function is not always positive. Oh. It goes up and down above the x-axis and below the x-axis. Would it be cosine of we're gonna put four in there, we get two pi over three again. Cosine of two pi over three. Negative one half. Negative one half. So it's negative. So your velocity also is negative. So is your speed increasing, decreasing, or not either? Increasing. Your speed is increasing. Your speed is backwards and it's getting more negative, right? Because your acceleration is in line with that. 
velocity, right? So you're moving backwards, negative velocity, and your acceleration is also negative, so also pushing you faster backward. So your speed, Holy the magnitude Lord. of your velocity is increasing. So increasing. <coughs> Okay, now we're looking yeah, at this green guy right here. All they're saying is take the derivative of the product of f and g and plug one into it. That's what f dot g prime of one is saying. This, this this thing right here? Yeah. yeah. Take the derivative of the multiplied together. Not the derivative times the derivative. The derivative of the, the product of the two functions. What does it look like it's, what does it look like it is involved in this problem? Probably something from the section you just did homework for. Quotient. Numbers. The quotient rule, because you see a quotient, f of x is 1 over x minus 2, right? Um, so to take the derivative of f, if that's something you wanted to do, uh, you might need to use the quotient rule. They're also telling us, well, they're not telling us anything about g. We don't know what g yeah. even is. We don't know what g, g of x is. But we do know that if you were to take f times g and take the derivative of that uh, and put 1 into it, you would get 6. We know that the derivative of g with 1 plugged into it is negative 1. And we know that we want to find g of 1. Okay. Look at all of this stuff. Oh, I think I got it soon. You lose your computer frozen? Is that what's going on? It's going to crash on that. Everything. Mm -hmm. It just depends. 
this stuff right here, this is the stuff they're giving you, like this seemingly random stuff. It what? Didn't, it didn't work. I got an idea. What is, uh, what, what's your idea, Aaron? Well, uh, well I just kind of, so I just did f of x times g of x, and so f of x is like 1 over x minus 2, uh -huh. so like times g of x, and so g of x is uh, and I did it. And G of X, so 1 over x minus 2 times G of X is equal to G of X over x minus 2. Oh, okay. And then after that, I found the derivative of that, and that's, I used a quotient property. Okay. And when I did the quotient property, so you have like, so we have a wall, which is x minus 2. Well, I'm going to just stop you right there, because... Because what we have there is g of x over x minus 2, which is just g of x over the denominator of x minus 2. It's not g of x over f of x. Um, yeah. f of x is 1 over x minus 2. So then if you use the quotient rule on that, you won't be finding the derivative of like f of x over g, or g of x over x, f of x. Right? What we do have is that what this means is the derivative of f times g. Okay? So what we have is the derivative of f of x times g of x. Okay. Can we take the derivative of a function times a function? Yes. Product what does that rule. look like? Product, Product rule, which says what? f prime, f prime of x g times g x plus g prime f of x times x. Right? I know they were in parentheses, so I thought you were just trying to scribble. Freak out. Freak out. Well, we want to find g of 1, right? We want to plug 1 into this whole thing. What happens if you plug 1 into the derivative of the product? You get 6. So this side is 6. OK. And then we want f prime of x. Can we take the derivative of f? Yes. Of, of f? Yes, we can. With with the quotient property, quotient rule. Okay, so that's going to be low. That's x minus two. Here we'll take uh, f prime over here. Low x minus two. D high, which is zero, minus high, which is one times d low, which is just one. Over the square root. What's below? Square. x minus 2 squared. Okay. So we get well, negative 1 over x minus 2, negative 1 over x minus 2 squared. Okay. So we can do f prime of 1, we can put 1 into there. We get negative 1 over 1 minus 2 squared, negative 1 over um, 1. 1. Negative 1. So negative 1. That's what f prime of 1 would be. Alrighty. What's g of 1? No. Oh, that's the thing we want to find, right? Oh. Plus, what's g prime of 1? <laughs> Sorry. What's g prime negative of 1? Negative, negative 1 plus a negative 1 times, what's f of 1? Uh, negative 1. 1 in there? Mm, 1 over 1 minus 2? Negative 1. Yeah, just 1 negative 1. Okay. So. <laughs> one, right? Plus so. a one. So we'll subtract one from both sides. We get five mm -hmm. equals negative g of one. So, so g of one equals negative five. Equals negative five. Oh, gosh. B. 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 That's what I was gonna say the whole time. <laughs> that was your random guess. Yep. Random guess was negative five. Wow. When, when, I I said, when I said f, of, when I said f times g, I'm not sure. I thought it means like a fine. Anyway, I'm sorry. Huh? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
switch the other rings. So what they want you to find is h prime of one, which means you know taking the derivative of h, uh, plugging one into it. So I want to know. But what's h? H is just the product of f and g. Right? So if we want to take the derivative of h, we want to take the derivative of f times g, which uses the what? Oh, no product. Yes. Yes. H prime of x equals, uh, let's say, f of x times g of x. And then we want to take the derivative of that. And that is f prime g plus g prime. Oh, G prime oh, no. F. Okay. If we want to know H of H prime of one, we want to find H prime of one. That's where we plug one into all of this stuff. So that's F prime of one times G of one plus G prime of one uh, times F of one. Yeah. Do you know what F prime of one is? Why does it look like two? I'm estimating. Estimating, what are you estimating? Looking at the graph. Looking at the graph, and what, what about the graph? At x equals one, it looks like function f approaches two. The value of the function is two? Yeah, sure. Would that be f of one, or f prime of one? F of one. F of, so we could find f of one, so we do want that, that's two. But what's f prime of one? What does f prime mean? The slope. The slope. Oh, what's the slope of this function? Which is two. It is, al it is also two. Up two and over one, up two and over one. The slope of this guy is two. So two times. What's g of one? One. Looks like one. One. Like g of one is one? And then it's negative one. Negative one. Negative one for g prime? <laughs> so. Two minus two is zero. Two minus two. So the answer is zero. Okay, and then we'll say really similar thing for this problem, right? Yeah. You're gonna use the, the quotient rule. You're gonna do all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. There's a minimal time left. Yeah. No time yet. Uh, so similar thing, if you want to try that out, the notes will be put up and the video will be up and you can look at it and see how you do. Um, so give that but a shot. H dub. What's that? But H dub? Yep, let's have the homework. Did I have the homework already? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, what's the homework? Yes. Uh, well? We write down, please. Yeah, that's not what it is. Okay. Um...